This week on Vaticano, join us at Rome's Angelicum University, where George Weigel discusses John Paul II and the challenges Russia and China pose to the international order. Experience the streets of Rome full of people marching for the right to life. Also, learn why scientists agree that we should forgive constantly. And in a few weeks, the World Meeting of Families will take place at the heart of the Eternal City. Find out with us why healthy families are more important than ever. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Cardinalem Poitiva. John Paul II began his pontificate with the words, be not afraid, a phrase that the Polish Pope's biographer believes can be applied to Vatican diplomacy with Russia and China today. George Weigel, author of the biography, Witness to Hope, spoke at Rome's Angelicum, where the future Pope studied on May the 18th, the 102nd anniversary of John Paul II's birth. I think that Antiphon, be not afraid, was embodied in his determination to speak truth to power, as he did at the United Nations in 1979, to call communist regimes to uh, honor the commitments they had made to human rights, especially religious freedom. That was all part of what Be Not Afraid meant in the diplomatic world. Weigel argued that the Vatican's pursuit of Ostpolitik, a diplomatic strategy championed by Cardinal Agostino Casaroli in the 1970s that avoided public condemnation of communism's human rights breaches for the sake of reaching diplomatic agreements, failed to achieve its goal of guaranteeing the Church's freedom to live its sacramental life by its own standards. I think it was a mistake not to call this a war. Uh, he's been much sharper in recent weeks in his commentary. Uh, but I think there is a general misunderstanding in the Vatican of the character of Putin's regime and the character of his ambitions and how they're based in part on a false religious idea that Russia is the only legitimate heir of the baptism of the Eastern Slavic peoples in 988. George Weigel believes that in pursuing diplomatic strategies that require the Pope and the Vatican to avoid public condemnation of human rights violations, the Holy See risks losing its moral authority when it comes to the People's Republic of China. I think this is a very sad situation, uh, particularly with respect to China. The tepid response to the arrest of Cardinal Zen leads to the deterioration of the moral authority of the Holy See. Saturday the 21st of May, the National Italian Demonstration in Defense of Life took place in Rome. This year, the slogan was simply, Choose Life. It was a march that saw thousands of people parade through the main streets of the Italian capital, from Piazza della Repubblica to Piazza San Giovanni Laterano. We want to launch a message of hope in life. We want to instill in the new generations the desire for parenthood, the desire to become a father, a mother, the desire to have children, because life is the safest investment, also for the economic well-being of a country. Conceived and promoted in 2011, the National March for Life has returned after almost two years of health restrictions dictated by the pandemic to parade through the streets of Rome, thanks also to the support of more than 100 organizations and associations. We have to restart after the tragedy of the pandemic. So to start again, we have to start with life and the family. Our demonstration is meant to be an encouragement to invest in life. It's a demonstration to say no to those laws that do not protect life from the moment of conception until natural death. Choosing life is beautiful. This was the message repeatedly chanted from the megaphone and echoed through the streets of the capital. We hope that this march 
will help us to keep the level of attention high to encourage people for life. That is why we will have one each year. Ma mi ricorda di aver fatto la scelta giusta, scegliere la vita. It's a march that presents a public testimony to the ethical unacceptability and social wounding of abortion, euthanasia, and all other offenses that are directed against human dignity today. Hello and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, bringing you the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. Pope Francis said he's praying for the church in China and attentively and actively following the often complex life and situations of the faithful and the pastors there. The Holy Father did not specifically mention the recent arrest of Cardinal Zen in Hong Kong. Zen was released on bail but will have to stand trial very soon. The Pope recognized a miracle attributed to the intercession of Teofilo Camomod, a Filipino archbishop with a reputation for having the ability to bilocate. Even during Camomod's lifetime, many miracles were attributed to the archbishop. Catholic schools should not be Christian in name only, but in fact, said the Holy Father speaking to the De La Salle Christian brothers. He underlined that Christian educators must first of all be witnesses to the Christian Gospels. And first of all, being a witness, then he's a teacher to the extent that he's a witness, Pope Francis said. In the future, religious brothers who are not priests are allowed to lead their religious communities with Vatican permission. The pontiff said that the Vatican congregation overseeing religious orders can, in individual cases and at its own discretion, grant permission for non-priest religious members to assume the role of major superior. Pope Francis lamented the prevalence of modern forms of slavery, even in the most developed areas of our world. Speaking to experts involved in the fight against human trafficking, the Holy Father underlined the need to support, accompany and reintegrate victims of trafficking into our communities and help them in the healing process and the restoration of their self-esteem. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. I'm Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Dear brothers and sisters, the next world meeting of the families will be held in Rome in June 2022. The theme of the meeting will be family love, a vocation and a path to holiness. After almost two years of suspended events due to the coronavirus pandemic, the 10th World Meeting of Families will finally take place in Rome this summer. Four years after the last World Meeting of Families in Dublin, families, theologians, and believers from all over the world will again come to the Eternal City from June the 22nd to the 26th. International representatives of Family Pastoral Ministry will participate in the Pastoral Congress and the Family Festival. The Holy Father is calling on all local dioceses to create parallel places of encounter and to carry out initiatives that implement the motto of the World Meeting of Families. It will be a meeting where it is possible where you can get to know each other, meet the Holy Father, listen to his word, and confront each other. We are in the synodal journey, so we are in that phase of listening to each other. The first World Meeting of Families was held in Rome on October the 8th and 9th in 1994 at the suggestion of Pope John Paul II. Since then, this event has been organized to take place every three years and in different places of the world. It's typically introduced by an international theological pastoral congress. The challenges facing families today are many. In many countries, there are efforts to soften and relativize the traditional concept of family. 
At the same time, the state is in many cases trying to take over the very task of raising children, which has always been the responsibility of parents. Pope Francis wrote this in Evangelii Gaudium. The family is experiencing a profound cultural crisis, as are all communities and social bonds. In the case of the family, the weakening of these bonds is particularly serious because the family is the fundamental cell of society, where we learn to live with others despite our differences and to belong to one another. It is also the place where parents pass on the faith to their children. I believe that the Christian family, the family that shines of the love that is celebrated in marriage, is a witness that overcomes even all the critical issues and difficulties. So the Church proposes this message, that it shines because of its beauty, and it is a message that is always valid, because it fascinates all generations, because it is beautiful to love each other for a lifetime and promise love and fidelity forever. In his 2018 letter, Gaudete et Exultate, Pope Francis reminded us that, in keeping with this year's theme of the World Meeting of Families, married couples also have an important vocation to one another. There are many holy married couples in which each of the spouses has been an instrument for the sanctification of the other. The prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, Cardinal Marcello Semeraro, knows who could serve as a role model for families. We have come out of a year dedicated to St. Joseph. St. Joseph is not a parent, but he is a father. How many parents are really fathers? There are many parents whose fathers never became fathers, and there are so many fathers. I think of educators, even priests, and so on. Teachers who were fathers, but are not their children. Coming World Meeting of Families will have a place for all these families. This is also emphasized by the Director of Communications of the Diocese of Rome. Rome will welcome these families. It will welcome families who are searching. It will welcome families who are wounded. Families who have questions. Church, as a mother, will take care. And that is what is done through parishes and family ministry. But there will be a revival also through this war meeting that wants to encourage parishes and movements to take care of families. Not only Mother Church is looking forward to the visit, but also the Holy Father, and he's calling for action. Take courage then, dear pastors and dear families, and help each other to organize meetings in the diocese and parishes on every continent. Have a good journey to the forthcoming World Meeting of Families. May is the International Mental Health Awareness Month. More and more people seek the help of professionals because they experience difficulties on a psychological level. New research now shows that this would probably not be necessary at all if people would practice one of the core Christian concepts more regularly, forgiveness. Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Thonhauser met Andrew Saracen in Rome during a conference on church and science. The president of the Templeton World Charity Foundation explained why he sponsored research into forgiveness and how it can help us all to lead better lives. How does mental health and forgiveness work together? May is Mental Health Awareness Month and for over 20 years, the Templeton Foundations have been supporting research on forgiveness, in particular, its relation to mental health. Um, forgiveness is a process of the head and the heart that takes a trauma or a hurt and converts a negative feeling thoughts and actions, converting that into positive 
thoughts, feelings, and actions. So I think of forgiveness as a psychological miracle moving from um, negativity to positivity. Very little is heard about forgiveness, but actually this concept is also on a scientific basis where you say, uh, no, this is something we need to focus on. The research shows that forgiveness is um, as important as uh, pharmaceuticals when it comes to uh, preventing anxiety and depression. In fact, if we could have a pill that gave you the same benefit uh, for your mental health uh, as forgiveness does, it would be licensed and sold in countries around the world. How, how does that work? First, forgiveness starts with an awareness of a wrongdoing. And so it's a cognitive thing that happens in your brain. Um, you do need to become aware and concentrate and find the place uh, of hurt. And often that is recalling a specific event that occurred in your life. Um, uh, but in many cases, actually, that does require a forgiveness of self first before you can forgive somebody else. But we, as I said before, it is a process of the head and the heart and starts with a decision to forgive and then is um, accompanied also by um, an emotional release. Uh, when we think of religion, for example, Christianity or, or also uh, the Catholic Church, their forgiveness always played a big part. Uh, we, we think of confession where you're also being told that you are forgiven. Does that make sense in the light of that research? Absolutely does. I think um, you know, inspired by the commitments and the obligations of the Christian faith towards forgiveness, um, you know, that really speaks to the first part um, of, of forgiveness, this idea that um, we need to decide, it's a commitment that we must make. But you bring up penance in, in confession, and often penance is, is something that has a bodily element. You need, you know, you need to say the rosary, uh, you need to speak the words, you need to visualize um, the wrongdoing that you've done. Even the act of, of speaking it to somebody else is a very much uh, embodied thing. And, and within the scientific community, do you find there great openness to that kind of concept? So I think within the scientific community, there's a tremendous openness for forgiveness. Um, you know, psychologists or mental health therapists realize we don't have all the tools we need to address the growing mental health crisis. And so there are workbooks that uh, you can do, um, and we've published a few of them on a website called discoverforgiveness.org. Uh, that, that you can go to. Uh, I think, uh, on the other hand, sometimes that we do find a resistance to forgiveness in broader culture. People think that if I forgive, I lose power, that I somehow, uh, you know, cede power that I have to somebody else, I become less powerful. Also, some people think that when I forgive, I lose the ability to pursue justice. And the fact of the matter is that, again, research shows that I don't. You actually gain power. You gain agency and a sense of control over your own life when you forgive. And, and similarly, you are able to pursue justice independently. So how often should we forgive our brother? Uh, 70 times 70. Uh, 70 times 70. <laughs> Andrew, thank you for being with us. Andrew Saracen, president of the Templeton World Charity Foundation, here with us in Rome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. Throughout the centuries, the Virgin Mary has been represented in Christian art with different facial features, skin colors, and nationalities. Despite the different appearance, all these images represent one historical person, Mary of Nazareth, the mother of Jesus Christ. In representing her, Christian art has been inspired by the first images found in the Roman catacombs and ancient icons attributed by tradition to St. Luke the Evangelist. St. Luke's icons are called Achiropita for the divine intervention to leave a pictorial documentation of Our Lady in the form of an icon. But there's a second type of Achiropita. 
the image that miraculously appeared on the tilma of St. Juan Diego in Mexico, known as Our Lady of Guadalupe, is also called Ajiropita. Comparing the two Ajiropita images, it's seen that Our Lady not only has different facial features, but she's also of a different race. Which of these images, then, displays the true face of Our Lady? According to art historian Elizabeth Lev, these two images don't contradict each other. That is actually a very uh, a beautiful continuation, no? If we have these first uh, Achiopite that arrive in the Mediterranean basin and the, you know, the images that go to Constantinople and the centers that are going to be the traditional centers of Christianity, the early Christian church, but to have one uh, uh, stake a claim in the new world uh, so early on is really, I think, uh, it's just a beautiful statement about evangelization, about Mary who appears, uh, who changes her appearance, Mary who searches all over the world to create this church, Mary who is the church, uh, always bringing her face, bringing her image to new worlds, as it were. The Virgin Mary is not only a historical person, but she has a special place in the divine design of human salvation. Mariologist Father Salvatore Perella explains Our Lady's unique role in God's communication. Ma cosa servono le apparizioni? But what are apparitions for? Apparitions serve to remind us of God as presence, God as providence, God as the guide of humanity. God, however, often allows himself to be grasped by man through the best believer, who is Mary, who is, let us say, the ambassador of heaven. Apparitions are never similar. They are always different, different eras, different situations, different contexts. Think of the first modern apparition in 1531, the Mary of Guadalupe presenting herself to Juan Diego, the guise of an Indian to an Indian. What does this mean? That heaven takes cultures into account and respects cultures. Que il cielo tiene conto delle culture e rispetta le culture. Christian art follows divine revelation and reveals Our Lady's specific role in the church designed by God. Mary has been equated with the concept of the church, the ecclesia, from the beginning of Christianity. And the church is Catholic or universal. And so that Mary would be uh, an image that reflects the universality of the church. If Mary is out presenting her son, pointing towards her son in Asia, then she will look like the church in Asia. When she's presenting her, her son to the peoples of Africa, she looks, she becomes part of that world so that she can draw all of us to the one true Christ. And it's a really beautiful thing about the, the multifaceted, multifaces of Mary throughout the history of art. Father Salvatore Perella points out another aspect that influences the representation of the heavenly reality by those who've experienced Marian apparitions and then explain the appearance of Our Lady. Apparition is seeing and being seen by a personal, otherworldly reality, and you see it as I see you. It is clear that it always centers the psychological dimension. For example, when Mary appears, Mary appears in the form of the message itself. But Mary, we know, is in the other world and is a resurrected body. So Mary could not be sad, could not cry, because she is in joy. If she appears as a sorrowful one, if she appears as the weeping one, it means that she enters into the personal dynamism of the individual to communicate to him a message of conversion, to communicate to him a message of return of God. Because she is a figure who 
grows along with the church. She is part of this living thing that is the church and, and not just this figure that just, you know, say hi to her when you come in the room. I think it was very clear that Mary's role was meant to be one of constant intercession. And as the world grew, intercessors for all those people. People talk about the most photographed actresses or the Princess of Wales, the most photographed woman, but really the most represented woman in all of history is Mary. And she's been represented in so many different ways because of that extraordinary universality of the church, which is personified in the person of Jesus' mother, the Blessed Virgin. The true face of Our Lady is the Catholic Church itself, Catholic meaning universal and dear to every person and culture. Mary, Mother of God, Mother of the Church, New Eve, and Mother of all redeemed humanity.